Can I see what animal is this? No? What? No, duck, that's good, that's good, that's very good. Anybody else? Monkey, no? What is it? I have no idea what that is, but I would probably go with something like that. No? Anybody else? What? Rat, no. Platypus. Bat. No, oh, that's a new one. That's a new one. No, it's platypus. Pardon me? Oh, it is? I'm sorry. You learn something new every day. <laughs> I hope I can reciprocate in an hour, okay? So this is a platypus. And the story of platypus is absolutely fascinating. A very good friend of mine told it to me, and I have since read up about it. When platypus traveled to Europe from Australia, the British scientists didn't recognize it as a species, right? So it's sort of a mutant. It has fur like mammals, but it doesn't give birth to young, it lays eggs. It has webbed feet and a bill like a duck, hence the duck, right? So the British scientists thought that Chinese, it was a Chinese hoax. They thought Chinese have taken a bunch of animals, they cut them up in pieces and created this new animal to make fun of them and to create confusion, right? It took almost two decades for scientists to recognize platypus as species. And there was a zoologist at the British Museum of Natural History who even tried to take scissors and cut out the bill, thinking it's a duck. And today, if you go to the museum, you can actually see the marks of him trying to cut this out with scissors. Now, why is this relevant for our discussion today about innovation and sustainable development goals? Wow, I really did not prepare well. It says development superheroes. Today, we're seeing the emergence of new species when it comes to the sector of doing social good. We see the emergence of superheroes among policymakers, among citizens, among private sector, people who are doing things that are entirely disrupting the way that we know that policies are done, that social services are delivered, and, um, and the, that, that the development is being done. Internet disrupted media. <laughs> Uber is disrupting transport. These guys here are disrupting the way that the development and governing um, is being done. These guys, the development superheroes, are designing video games to help farmers make better decisions about what type of fertilizers to use and how much to use them in order to increase their yield and reduce pollution. These superheroes are opening up years of procurement data on the local level and they're inviting the citizens to come in and help them identify corruption that they might have missed through the use of open data. These superheroes are designing platforms and apps that enable citizens who can help be connected to those who need help or who use the way people use mobile phones to be able to better determine what is the risk of an earthquake hitting Istanbul on Monday morning versus Saturday afternoon because they're able to track um, transport and movement patterns. These superheroes are crowdfunding for having energy, in, energy efficient and energy independent schools. So in UNDP, four years ago, we've made a conscious decision to set up an innovation unit whose sole job would be to try and be interesting enough that these superheroes would actually want to work with us. Because our assumption was that if we can identify them, if we can be, be interesting enough to work with them, we would have a better shot at achieving better development results. We would have a better shot of increasing income for people living in this region, for having better governance, for uh, more sustainably using our natural resources. And today, I am proud to launch, it's a sort of a mixtape of compilation of best hits and stories from those four years where we worked with development superheroes to achieve these objectives um, in our region. And Ariel, who just took a picture of me, um, is going to tweet the link to that report where you will be able to hear some of these stories. So, 
the panel today, what we wanted to do is bring some of those superheroes to Istanbul so you can hear directly from them why is it that they wanted to work with you and DP in the first place? They're superheroes. They don't mingle with, our, with us regular people. What type of things do they do in their own communities, in their own countries? And most importantly, why huge multinational organizations like UNDP should take notice and should invest in working with them? So this is what we're going to do today. And since we are very gender imbalanced, as you see, we have a boy who is a minority here. Um, I'm not going to introduce them one by one uh, immediately. I'm going to let them tell you a little bit about their superhero deeds. And I think we should start with, uh, with the one who is in minority. So, Vanya, please, could you tell us what type of a superhero you are? And what is the one superhero deed that you're specifically proud of that you've done in your own community? Thanks, Millie. A poor old boy trying to explain what kind of a superhero he is. But first, when I was a really young boy, I dreamt about being a Batman, Spider-Man, Superman, or whatever, but never ever in my life I dreamt that somebody will introduce me as a platypus man. Thanks for this awesome. No problem. Here to please. Uh, since we're on the topic of uh, superheroes, I just have one quick side note. Uh, superhero category is very, very heavily male-dominated. <laughs> so even when you have a superhero team, you only have like one female member of the team. If you have the Avengers, it's Black Widow, one. If you have Justice League, it's Wonder Woman, one. If you have Fantastic Four, it's Invisible Woman, one. And this is for the first time a superhero team which consists of one male and all other females. So please guys, one big round of applause for my female superheroes right here. The one thing I loved this morning, which I would like to start my introduction with, was when at the opening of the conference, the guy said, we encourage you to use your smartphones as much as you want, and please use all social media outlets you prefer. So this was like a big change for like four and a half years ago. The first time I was at the UN event, I was on my smartphone all the time, and at one point of time, I was even younger back then, so at one point of time, a guy like really seriously said, could you please put the smartphone down and listen to what we are saying for one single minute? So it took us like four years to get to the point when you are encouraged from the other part to actively use your smartphones as a tool of mm -hmm. communication. It is an incidental that our innovation journey is four years old, <laughs> I think. <laughs> well, uh, m my NGO, Digitalizuime, is unofficially five years old and officially like four years old. But I will mm -hmm. tell the origin story yes. later on. Yeah. Thank you very much. Let's hear, um, we have Nano, who is a magician from Georgia, who has single-handedly single set up an innovation policy lab within, um, within Georgian government. Nano, maybe you can tell us a couple of, couple of words about yourself. Thanks, Mili. Uh, so it's first time for me to introduce myself from, as a superhero, from superhero perspective. So thanks for that, Mili. <laughs> Uh, so I will uh, briefly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Nana and I work for the Public Service Development Agency of the Ministry of Justice of Georgia. It's a semi-public um, entity. Uh, and our main mission is to improve the way uh, services, public services are designed and delivered. And we also help other government entities uh, to design better services. So uh, the, the main thing, um, I would like to start my, uh, my conversation today is uh, about telling the story about the lab. So, and when I'm thinking uh, of the possible reasons why I can be called superhero, <laughs> uh, is that um, it was actually a joint of effort, of course, as it always is. And we actually did uh, manage to establish an in-house uh, service innovation lab in a very bureaucratic, large. Uh, organization in Georgian government. It's the uh, Ministry of Justice. Um, uh, and you can imagine how uh, difficult it would be to uh, establish a, a formal structure uh, dedicated to work on experimentation, on testing different services, prototyping, and this kind of work. 
uh, and this is the part of their da daily routine, which is not routine anymore, per se. So um, this could be uh, attributed uh, to the fact that today I was presented as a superhero. Uh, it's a very a great privilege for me, of course. Um, and maybe I can tell later how this all happened and what's, how UNDP uh, contributed to this great achievement. Absolutely. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, so Shamilka works for a big software um, multinational organization. And over the last year and a half, um, she has helped target um, the skills and resources of that organization to helping our team in Belarus um, improve tourism, improve healthy lifestyles, and so on and so forth. So maybe a couple of things from your superhero port portfolio that we can hear. Thank you, Millie. Um, yes, I work for um, the company's name is EPALM, and uh, I'm based in uh, Minsk, Belarus, but the company is actually the founder is from Belarus, and um, we are um, registered in the stock market in the US, and our head office is in the US. Um, my superhero moments, wow, <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> a bit of a, um, a difficult task to mm. identify myself mm. as a superhero, but I, I took on the job as uh, overlooking uh, corporate social responsibility for EPAM in February. And um, basically, um, one of my main tasks was actually to get um, um, 5,000 plus uh, techies in EPAM to understand and uh, accept uh, my own view on uh, corporate social responsibility, identifying um, thematic areas which we identified as education, um, environment, and innovation. Uh, so one of the first things um, I did when I joined was to run a, a competition, a global competition, uh, on carbon, a carbon footprint calculator. Um, I can guarantee you 80% of uh, the people um, in my company at that point hadn't heard of what carbon footprint calculator was or carbon footprint. Um, so my task was to just first of all educate them and make them understand and then we ran this uh, great competition. And um, the end result was um, we had um, people competing from hung our offices in Hungary, Moscow, Ukraine and of course Belarus and there was a lot of interest um, and making them really um, uh, understand and also build their own knowledge about carbon footprint and what the calculator would do um, in their own individual lives. And now we actually have a global uh, tool that is online and accessible to everybody around our officers in all 21 locations um, globally. So I think that is my superhero moment, actually. Very cool. Thank you very much. Um, let's move. Vanya, tell us a little bit why, why did you want to work with UNDP in the first place? And, and having told us that secret, could you tell us a little bit uh, something that's important for you and us alike, what was different for people of Montenegro as a result of the work that you've done with us? Can I tell the real 100% honest 100%, story? 100%, the truth okay. and nothing but the but truth. The truth. <laughs> okay, so uh, digitalism as a movement, as a grassroots movement in Montenegro began about five years ago. But at that time, it wasn't formalized in any sense of the way. So we were something like the platypus from the very first slide. So what we were doing was organize Twitter meetups, uh, organize, uh, organizing uh, events regularly once a month. So trying to meet the organized meetings of digital community in Montenegro. So trying to get all the guys who are into innovation, creative guys, at one place and one time, at least once a month. So after like six or seven months, we got in touch with Millie, and we started brainstorming on a possible cooperation between UNDP and Digitalism. So at one point in time, there was like a cooperation between three parties, UNDP, Digitalism, and a private company who is in charge of .me, the internet domain of Montenegro. So one day Millie called and said, okay, so we've got everything under cover and could please someone come that, and we sign the contract. And I said, okay, so who do you want us to send? And she said, I don't know, who's in charge? Who's in charge of what? Your organization. Which organization? Your digitalism. And I said, I'm sorry, digitalism is not an organization, it's just a movement. And she said, well, you can call it whatever you want, just send someone who's in charge so we can sign the damn contract. 
And I'm like, but there. Was I really that rude? <laughs> it's a better story this way. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> and I'm like, but digitalism is not formally recognized in any single way. There's no one in charge. There is no formal organizational structure. And she said, said okay, in order to do this, you guys need to register somehow. So actually, we started like doing things like five years ago, changing Montenegro, but officially is like four months, four years and like four or five months. So that was our big start. The project was called Foursquare for Development of Montenegro. So what we can, did can, was... Can I rudely interrupt? Yeah. Anybody here uses Foursquare? Used Foursquare? Oh, nice. Okay. Foursquare okay, excellent. Swarm, good, good, good. Okay. Cold nowadays. Okay, cool. Okay, so what we did was four and a half years ago was try and use Foursquare as a geolocation service to help the tourists who come into Montenegro, especially to the northern region of Montenegro. Montenegro is like a huge tourist country, but 90% of tourists coming in go to the seaside. Almost no one goes to the northern part of the country. And if you try to go to the northern part of the country, you're basically up for yourself. There are no official tourist guides. The tourist guides which are online are very poorly updated. There are almost no brochures. So what we tried to do was use the power of Foursquare, crowdsource the ideas, then get the people to walk through northern part of Montenegro, pinpoint those locations, leave tips on Foursquares, and name like five or six different routes. So at the end of the project, you had like five different routes of Montene from Montenegro, like a historic route, uh, uh, forest routes route, honey route, and stuff, which were crowdsourced by people, and then pinpointed by regular citizens of Montenegro. And then at the end of the day, we invited like really famous bloggers from all over the region to come to Montenegro and to go through one of these routes and to see what it looks like. And they couldn't use anything except their smartphone and Foursquare. So that was our big break and the, like a cool origin story of digitalism. We weren't bit by a spider as Spider-Man. We weren't from Krypton like Superman, but we had Millie as our godfather. Nice, I paid him to say that. By the way, excellent, thank you. Um, there is, uh, Vanya has mentioned people and citizens a number of times in his presentations, and I think throughout this discussion, you will hear this pattern come up over and over and over again. And, and it might be a pattern that's sort of common sense, but there are difficulties, as, 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 as Vanya has mentioned, for us to work with somebody, you need to have a title, a bank account, um, an ability to sign a contract, which off the bat disqualifies huge swaths and clusters of citizens who are right now investing their own resources and skills for social good that we're not working with to help achieve SDGs. So just as a footnote to Vanya's, to Vanya's presentation. Um, Nando, maybe you can tell us a little bit, so you mentioned bureaucracy going against this huge um, wave and inertia and setting up the service lab. Could you tell us a little bit more about from the time you succeeded in setting up the lab to today, would a regular Georgian citizen notice? And also, what got you to work with UNDP? Thanks. Uh, I will start with the last part of the question, how we started working with UNDP to establish the lab. So it all started with the uh, setting that we had in Public Service Development Agency. So we already had this uh, formal structure in place called the Research and Development Department and especially the Innovations Unit, which was under the department. And actually we know that uh, these people had a very special uh, work to do, but we didn't have enough expertise and skills um, in place to enact this role of uh, actually designing and experimenting with different services uh, with more like citizen-centric approach. And we started drafting a proposal um, on how to introduce innovations, like how to build a culture of innovations in our agency, uh, which of course um, should affect the, the society at large in Georgia, and citizens of Georgia, basically. So we started this like a conversation and negotiations with UNDP Georgia, and then uh, through UNDP Georgia with um, Mili, 
And we had like different ideas, great ideas actually. And I was um, I was uh, uh, reading some different articles from, uh, um, for instance, Mind Lab, which is the Danish um, government in-house lab, and many others from UK, how they were setting these labs and how they were working with the citizen, co-creating different services. And this was the uh, same thing what was suggested by Millie and UNDP. Uh, let's do something like uh, Mind Lab did. Let's do something like. Uh, mm, Nesta is supporting. So these kind of activities which really work and which prove to be really effective in, some case, in, in most of the cases. Uh, so uh, we drafted this proposal and we started this project which lasted one year starting from 2014. And the main um, purpose of the project to build, was to build a skill set in our uh, R&D department and to set up an innovation service lab. Uh, and now we have this uh, lab already set up, and in this case, um, I could say that UNDP was kind of a uh, nudge uh, to us to like move forward and uh, actually uh, set, set this lab. Uh, and uh, I think um, there is a saying, it was, I will quote uh, Nesta's um, CEO, it's, Nesta is a UK-based uh, charity working on innovation uh, globally, and he once put it that uh, all government entities need um, institutions to uh, drive innovations and to work on innovation. So in our case, we had in internal institution in place and, and UNDP served as an external institution like a nudge and uh, institution which already had some uh, experience, some accrued uh, success stories from different uh, countries in the world, like in other mm parts of the world. So um, this was basically it. And to, to go back to the first part of the question, um, now we have already some small and modest twins. We collaborate with different government entities, testing different services, scaling up those which work and abandoning those which doesn't work without investing large amounts of resources and money. And this is how, like, this is actually something that's already is appreciated by many our government counterparts mm. and uh, other other countries as well. Yeah. So, very good. Um, there is one story from Georgia that I like very much. How many of you have been to the library the last week? Nobody goes to libraries anymore, right? I, I, I you know, li they're wonderful, but but we don't go to libraries anymore. Yet they're there. Um, local governments invest money to, to, to upkeep them. So one of the things that, 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 that they're, they're doing in Georgia is they're looking at libraries as a resource that's underused and thinking about how might we use them. And the idea on the table is following. We'll open libraries to startups, to, to, to young people with a hobby who want to start up a business. You can use the desk and chairs and Wi-Fi and electricity for free. We may even throw some bagels and coffee for free. You get to come here and you work. So the cost of running a business goes down, but we're gonna ask you to pay us in social capital. In other words, maybe one week in a month, we're gonna ask you, if you're spending time in this library, to work on an issue that the city is dealing with, whether that's um, more sustainable modes of transport or public safety but we want to use the skills and expertise that sit within you as citizens to help us solve these public issues that previously the local self-government was solving within the four walls of a municipality. Now that is a very, it's a very different proposition. It's a proposition that says we, the government, are here, you've given us a mandate and your tax money to help make your lives better, but we're not gonna just use the skills and expertise that we have, we're gonna open it up um, to all of you, and this um, and, and this is an example that can very well be scaled across across the region. So, so, so thank you for that, um, Shamilka. An interesting story from um, from from from, Be from Belarus. Um, you know, the, the the very first hack for social good in the country took place last year in September. Since there was a lot of things going on, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what you have done with UNDP and why um, were you working with UNDP in the first place. Um, I wasn't, but I was very much a part of that hackathon, so I really remember uh, being a part of it and actually participating. I was um, 
as an audience. Mm -hmm. I was in the audience. Um, yeah, so the first partnership actually um, happened when uh, UNDP uh, Belarus decided to launch the Innovation Lab. And um, as a part of the launch, uh, they got together with EPALM, the company I'm working for now, uh, and they decided to have a joint hackathon. Um, and the hackathon was around social change. Mm. Uh, it was uh, very broad, there were very, three very broad uh, range of topics that they decided to tackle at the hackathon. It was on disability, it was on environment, and it was on healthy lifestyle. Um, so both parties, of course, uh, for EPAM, a hackathon, of course, meant uh, something quite different to what uh, UNDP understood hackathon to be. Uh, uh, from a technical point, EPAM thought, oh, you know, UNDP, uh, the participants would come with their, you know, computers or laptops, and they would hack for 48 hours and develop an application. Uh, whereas uh, UNDP's idea was uh, completely different. It was totally non-tech. Um, and so there we had uh, social um, startups, entrepreneurs, uh, uh, people who actually participated without any uh, technology. Uh, so we had the two parties together in one room where Ipam was scratching their head wondering where the IT side of this whole hackathon was and um, UNDP was expecting a little bit more from Ipam. Um, and um, so finally, I mean, the hackathon took place and uh, EPAM facilitated the hackathon and then we had a lot of um, our own um, uh, engineers and support staff come and support the social startups to finally come up with uh, a prototypes which they presented on the final day. And, and in the end, it worked out very well. But there were a lot of lessons to be learned because here was a private company that runs hackathons practically every three months. And then there was UNDP that was very, uh, hackathons was completely uh, a different idea in their mind. You can, you can even be more clear. We <laughs> said we did not know. Well, we didn't use the word hackathon four years ago to be sort of quite, yes. quite frank. And uh, I mean, the res there was a result and it was positive and we found there were uh, winners chosen. And also from the UNDP point, um, they also realized, uh, I think, that uh, choosing a topic for a hackathon um, has to be extremely focused because, I mean, three broad areas. And I think for the jury, it was very difficult because, you know, there was healthy lifestyle, there was on environment, there was on disability. Um, so to pick a winner was also extremely hard. So um, the winner was picked, and, um, and then, of course, um, I joined IPAM in February, and we decided to also join forces with UNDP in July this year. Uh, we are uh, taking all the lessons learned from the previous hackathon. We had a very successful, we ran a very successful ha hackathon. It was around ecotourism, so we called it Hack for Tourism, and... Um, and it was uh, actually, um, both parties understood what was needed. Uh, we uh, kind of defined uh, the area that we were going to focus on. Um, and we took on um, a certain role where we also got involved in the process uh, mm -hmm. very much more than the first hackathon. And we had some great applications that came out of it. And uh, uh, it was uh, very successful. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. One of, the, one of the ideas was gamifying waste collection. How do you get people to dispose of waste more, more responsibly? So the game is basically a competition where you get to compete with, your other, with citizens as to who collects more trash and where you drop it off. And now that there's thinking in turn to turn that competition into almost like an alternative currency, right? So more waste you collect, more points you get that you can then cash into local businesses for discounts for things, whether it's a coffee shop or a grocery store or, 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 or what have you. So sort of a, a, an idea that connects both waste disposal and supports civic economy, which is absolutely fascinating. Um, so listening to you guys, one of the things that comes to mind is if we take that the only way that we have a chance in achieving SDGs is we being now looking at this purely from the organizational perspective, from selfishly from UNDP, is our ability to tap into skills and resources that go beyond more traditional and mainstream. From your experience in working with us, what would you have to say are one or two, what is, what is the advice that you can give to organizations like UNDP? What would we have to do to be better at working with you to be able to achieve some of the, some of the SDG goals? And, and any one of you guys, yeah, Shamilka? 
I think coming from the private sector, I think one of the <laughs> main areas to uh, kind of handle and focus on, I think from UNDP side would be bureaucracy because uh, the private sector moves uh, at such an incredibly fast pace. I mean, we, everything needs to be done like yesterday. So uh, even with an idea uh, that sometimes, you know, we have great ideas together, we come up with ideas, but then to actually implement it, um, when you're working with any of the agencies or sometimes INGOs, you know, the process is a lot longer, I guess, um, to, uh, I think they're so driven by documentations and uh, justifications and outputs, outcomes, you know, yep. so much time is spent, whereas uh, I think um, with the private sector, it's more the idea is there. Um, okay, uh, let's find a means, we have the capabilities, uh, let's not think so much about um, what we are going to achieve at the end of it, because I, I think you would achieve it at the end of it, I mean. Let's get it done. Fair enough. Nana, maybe? Um, sure. So, uh, talking about this, like, future, looking at, and uh, talking from government perspective, actually, um, my advice would be that continue what you are doing. <laughs> Uh, I mean, like injecting different so, uh, success stories to us, to government, so that we can, like, see and uh, we can have the proof that this works, and we can we can do it. We can actually get things done, uh, rather than like uh, relying on expertise and external support. We actually have to do uh, these things ourselves, and UODP is. Um, uh, helping us in this and also I want to emphasize one thing that we are about to um, organize soon together with UNDP and this is something that is really important and we are preparing for this uh, and uh, actually in December we are organizing um, innovations uh, meetup get together in Tbilisi Georgia and the main aim of this event is to uh, come identify most pressing um, problems issues uh, uh, in Georgia, uh, and we are uh, working with different government entities like line ministries to come up with uh, certain problems that need to have some sort of solutions. Uh, and then we are kind of trying to reverse engineering it. And this is something that was actually um, suggested by UNDP. Um, so there is this understanding that if private sector succeeded in reverse engineering while competing on the market, why don't we do this in government and also in development? Uh, so for instance, there are already a certain solutions in place and innovation is not only about like come up, coming up with something totally new that was never testing in other parts of the world. So why invest so many um, human resources and so much like finances in investing something new, what we don't know how it will work out and play out in the future. So, uh, and the understanding is that let's, let's pick a solution, like a similar solution, and like analyze it, dismantle it, like rip it in a, uh, apart, and then uh, reassemble it due to like um, um, specific local context. Mm. So this is something that we are, um, envisaging the tryout in Georgia this can, December. Can you give us an example of a very practical sure. issues that you yes. would like to do this on? Uh, yes, and by now we have identified three major problems uh, uh, suggested by uh, ministries actually facing these problems in Georgia. One of them, one of those is like safety on roads, which is uh, of course, uh, like in many other countries, a very major Not in Istanbul. Problem. Safety on the roads is not an issue in Istanbul, right? <laughs> Great drivers? <laughs> Just checking if everybody's still awake. I come from Montenegro. Safety on the roads is just a non-issue. We're worse than Istanbul drivers. So let me just... Yeah. Georgia so safety on the roads. Big, same okay. problems. Yeah. Safety on the roads is the first issue. The second one is the public transport. And mm. by this, I mean how we can make citizens use, actually, actually use public transport. Mm. Uh, and the third one was the waste management, as mm. you have just mentioned, uh, how we can make citizens more responsible uh, in, in uh, waste management yep. when they are disposing yep. their waste. Yep. So these three issues have been selected mm. and now we're trying to find partners like owners or um, 
generators of uh, solutions elsewhere in other parts of the world and just to pair them up with our local uh, problem owners, mm. so to say, mm. so that they can reverse engineering, engineer this solution. And the let's Georgian see what it's, yeah. how it comes. Fascinating. You were also looking, because uh, after the floods in Tbilisi, one of the really striking things was how quickly citizens organized themselves um, to go over 12,000 people with less than 48 hours were out in the streets um, uh, helping. Is the government looking at how, can, how might you go about engaging more, more structurally, more strategically with, with, with citizens that, as Vanya mentioned, have you know, not exactly. necessarily a common bank account or a title? Yeah, and this is something that inspired our new mayor of Tbilisi municipality to uh, work on different other problems to, to like pay, um, look at this uh, crowdsourcing as a very success uh, story because mm -hmm. uh, during this flooding, most of the work was done by self-organized individuals. So this is something that they are still, yeah. right now they are working on. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, to replicate this yeah. in other, other yes. parts. Excellent. There is a similar thing in, in, in Istanbul. Now I've come across it just recently, Zumbara. It's a time bank. Has, who, who's, who's heard? Yeah? Who's used Zumbara? It's a fantastic concept where if, if I'm an accountant, I provide a service to somebody and instead of getting paid, I get credits that I can use to get a service from someone else. It's almost like an alternative currency structure that, that what it does, the reason why I think it's relevant for development is connects people in the community. It builds those social ties that at any point in time you might tap in and activate in case of, for example, emergency. So it's something... Something to look at. Thank you. Vanya, maybe advice, advice for us, but also from your end, what, what do you think, what did we bring to the table in Montenegro um, in terms of solving? I think we might have decided that you have talked enough. <laughs> you used their work count. Okay, I'll use, okay, it's on now. Uh, uh, you too mentioned government and the citizens self-organizing on using social media. Um, in reality, government would always prefer citizens not to self-organize on social media. <laughs> Just a quick side note. So, Fair enough. Uh, one of my favorite management thinkers is uh, Nilofer Merchant, at Nilofer on Twitter, mm -hmm. and she likes to say that future will not be created. Future will be co-created. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to be government's job, uh, UN's job, citizen's job, NGO job to create a separate vision of the future. We all need to work together in order to create a single vision of the future. Uh, and Navy SEALs have a famous mantra which says failure is not an option. But if you convert that to an organizational standpoint, then you can also say if failure is not an option, then innovation is not an option. Mm -hmm. Because there's absolutely no way you can innovate without making mistakes. Mm -hmm. So m my first recommendation would be that in the opening you said uh, you just tweeted a link to the report, which is a compilation of best hits. In order to achieve something like really, really, really good, it should be a compilation of best hits and best misses at the same time. Blunders. Yeah, blunders. Yeah. Because, yeah. like I said, it's, it's very easy to paint a picture of innovation being a straightforward, mm -hmm. linear process with only good things happening, but there are all sorts of blunders on the way. Mm -hmm. uh, Facebook original mantra was move fast and break things. things. Yeah. Because if you're not breaking things on the way, then you're actually not moving either fast enough or not doing stuff that matters, really. Uh, when you mentioned the superheroes, our, the stuff we are doing, the one thing that crossed my mind is the superhero I would like my NGO to be. It's the Flash. So the only superpower the Flash has, it's his speed. He's not as strong as the Incredible Hulk. He's not invincible like the Superman, but he's very, very, very fast, swift, and agile. Mm. So, in, I mean, uh, international organization is like a, a tanker at mid-sea. It needs like days to turn around. 
for us to succeed, we need to move like really, really, really fast, blazingly fast, and break things, and have blunders, and have misses. Mm -hmm. It is a messy stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things which was like the, the biggest lesson for Montenegro, and for both my organization and for UNDP was Montenegro, was our first big collaborative project, Open Ideas for Montenegro. Uh, so what we decided to do was crowdsource what are, what are the itches the citizens feel. So what are the problems ordinary, regular citizens have all over the country? And it was not only an online poll. So if you don't have a computer, I'm not going to listen to your voice. So we had volunteers going in every single municipality, every single town in Montenegro, no matter how poor they are, knocking on almost every door and asking people, what is it that itches you? What is the itch you would like that somebody scratches? Mm. So we had a list of like few hundred different problems, issues, and then we put it up for a vote. Then we had put it down to like 10. And then we said, okay, so our NGO will put up an online platform with all those issues and citizens can team up and then make solutions to those problems. Mm. Uh, at the end, we, you had a jury, you picked up the, uh, the best solution. But the uh, lesson here was that at the end, at the beginning of this process, we had absolutely no clue what will come out in the end. We didn't know what issue will be solved. We didn't know what team will be there. We didn't know if it's going to be a smartphone app or a TV show or whatever. So we had an end vision, but we had absolutely no idea what will happen on this journey. Obviously, there were both hits and misses, but the, at the end of the journey, we got something that was way, way bigger than both UNDP and Digitalism could even imagine in the first mm. place. Thank you very much. It's really, it's, it, it, it's a, listening to you talk, I wonder whether for next year's Social Goods Summit we can replicate this so by the time we come to this day, we could already have filtered out itches for Turkey and recognizing some of the citizens who would get involved in coming up with, with solutions and actually celebrate them here. Thank you. So I'm conscious of the time, but I do not want to close without giving you guys an opportunity to let us know about some of your plans moving forward. So what are some of the superhero um, plans and ideas that you have uh, for the end of this in 2016 where you're hoping to make um, the community that you're a part of better? Shamilka. Um, so I think um, it's a great alliance between, um, for us personally, with EPOM and UNDP working together. Um, and for us, um, one of our... Um, goals and I think uh, what we've been doing is also not just in Belarus to connect with UNDP Belarus but also to have uh, a si develop a similar relationship with UNDP China, UNDP Ukraine um, where we see that we have um, capabilities and knowledge and uh, skills that we would like to transfer and use uh, the knowledge of UNDP in uh, wherever we are located um, to see where we can positively make a, a, like a positive mm. impact um, to the greater community. Yeah. So by using um, the means of hackathons or whatever it takes us to <coughs> uh, be able to make that impact, we would like to be able to uh, work with UNDP going forward. And I think ideally that is where for us by the end of the year and next year hopefully we would like to uh, take this call. Great. Thank you. Nana? So, uh, since uh, our lab was formally launched in 2014, we have had several like small and modest projects already implemented with success, of course, uh, most of them. Uh, so, and, uh, and all of them were like pilot projects, uh, uh, which can be subject to further scale up. Uh, like as you mentioned, Millie, this uh, project regarding public libraries um, is something that we already piloted and very successfully. And now we are um, putting together a new project to be um, launched in October, uh, like 
this this month actually, uh, end of October, together with our um, US-based partners, um, IREX. Uh, and we are um, trying to um, include a um, larger number of libraries. So right now we have 14 of them already selected in Georgia. And we would like to redesign those libraries together with the librarians actually working in those libraries and the, the actual consumers of those library services to make them more attractive for, for users uh, so that they can use it for different purposes like finding jobs, starting small businesses, and etc. So this is one thing. The other thing is that um, um, in general terms, we want, would like to increase the role of the Service Innovation Lab so that it can be used by other government entities at large in Georgia uh, and make joint projects. And of course, this um, big event that we're currently planning in December, this get together or meet up or whatever we call it, we don't have the official word yet, the, the name yet selected. Uh, so we. Um, we truly hope that these three issues, so once they are selected and uh, confirmed, we will find uh, best matches, like in terms of already existing solutions, and we will um, implement those or facilitate and catalyze to implement those. Maybe it will be not us actually implementing those uh, projects and solutions, but it will be in uh, cooperation with other government entities. So these are our plans for the superhero plans. Thank you very much, Vanya. And what's on your plan coming up? Uh, first of all, does everyone know the movie Back to the Future? Yeah. So in Back to the Future Part Two, they actually go back to the future. And does anybody know what date it was? 2015. Sorry. 2015, yeah. Wow, it was, we got some real movie buffs, geeks. Yeah, nerd. It's an October 21st, 2015. So it's been 15 days. Oh. So back then, a science fiction movie predicted that 2015 will be the future. So the first thing we need to ask ourselves is the future what, because we are living in future already. So the first thing we need to ask ourselves, is the future the same thing as we envision it to be? And if not, what do we need to do in order to meet this hashtag 2030 now? Because this is only in 15 years. And 15 years is much shorter period than Back to the Future was originally filmed in, in the 80s. So back in the 80s, 2015 looked like a year where you will have flying cars, uh, uh, Nikes with self-lacing shoes, new brand of Pepsi Cola and stuff. It's not really happening. Uh, the flying uh, carpet, skateboard, the flying skateboard. So we're actually not driving around in flying mm. cars and having flying skateboards. So what are we going to do now to have 20? to be ready for 2030. Uh, in the industrial age, efficiency was the key. In the social era, relationships mm. are the key. So we should work on these relationships in order to have the 2030 the way we really want it. Mm. Thank you very much. So, I mean, I would like to close with a quote that we use a lot in our team, which is the future is already here, but it's unevenly distributed. William Gibson. Um, so, what we're finding out is the development and policy making superheroes are already making that future. The success of organizations like our own, UNGP, is our ability to identify them, get to know who they are and the work that they do and be able to connect with them and jointly co-create what, what that um, future should be. And this is, this is what we will be doing within our innovation work and in that way contribute at least a teeny tiny part towards um, achieving the sustainable development goals. I would like to thank um, Vanya, Nana and, and, and Sanaka, who, uh, Sanaka. <laughs> Shamilka who have flown um, a long way to come to Istanbul to be with us, to present their superhero stories with us. Thank you very much for working with us over the years. You have made our job a lot more fun and a lot more impactful for the people um, in the three countries um, that you're from. And I would like to thank you guys who have uh, patiently and actively uh, been a part of uh, the panel. And I hope you come off with some of the really cool, inspiring superhero stories from these three guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, it was a, it was a wow panel. <laughs> <laughs>
you know, everything. And I, I quoted your quote. Oh, Future you. won't be created, but it will be co-created. 